Hi, and welcome back to the CE Drive podcast. Uh, in this episode, we'll have Daryl Brown on. Daryl is a um, financial planner and uh, investment analyst, and you'll hear he wears many hats when we get into the interview. Uh, this episode will be good for life insurance credits in all jurisdictions, no accident and sickness credits in Alberta. Um, and we're going to have a fair number of investment themed episodes over the summer here or the spring, I guess. And so there um, maybe not a ton of ANS credits right away, but we'll get you some. And then uh, FP Canada, it'll be good for a financial planning credit. It'll be good for an IAS credit as well. Um, it'll be good for an MFDA credit and an IROC credit. Okay, uh, we'll get right into what we need to get into here because the interview is uh, pretty long. So the object for today, it's actually not something that sits behind me. It's something that sits right here beside me. And this is my blackboard. I actually have two of them, these little blackboards that I use and uh, really cut down on my paper usage that way. But when I'm running through class or whatever, I'm taking quick notes. And that's also where my to-do lists live and so forth. One of the grandkids' favorite tricks is to come in and erase the whiteboard, and then I feign anger, and they uh, get a big kick out of it. Okay, uh, let's launch into the interview with Daryl. Thanks. Hi, I'm here today with Daryl Brown. Daryl is the founder at You and Yours Financial, and a couple of other hats he wears also. Uh, Director of Portfolio Strategies at Spring Plans. In Spring, actually, we had uh, Julia Chung on previously from Spring. That's who introduced us, Daryl. Thanks. And also Senior Investment Planner for Good Investing, which is uh, Tim Nash's firm. And uh, I'll put a link actually in the show notes because you just did, well, not I guess not just, but you did an interview recently with Tim on his podcast, the Financial Post like, Responsible Investing Podcast, is that what it's called? Yep, that is the Responsible Investing Podcast, and it is produced by the Toronto Star. Oh, the Toronto Star. I'm sorry. Oh, I'll get, I'll get sued here. All right. Um, wow, I get my big media conglomerates confused. So the uh, so for starters here, can you just give us a little background about who you are, Daryl, and how you ended up where you are today? I sure can. Um, so I am the founder of Universe Financial. Um, that is the uh, very small firm I founded when I left my corporate job uh, a number of years ago. Um, so that's where I landed when I um, left Sun Life Investment Management. Um, I really wanted a space where I could have you know my own voice, uh, be independent, not feel the sort of pressure to kind of go out and, and, and sell. And so you know, really, my focus there was on um, and has been on um, investor education and financial empowerment. So that's where I started. Um, and along the way, hanging out in probably the Twitterverse, you know, I came across a few other like-minded individuals who wanted to work in the sort of same manner that, that I did on a more advice-only basis, um, an independent basis. And so um, I started collaborating with um, Spring Plans and, you know, after a while and getting a little bit of comfort with how they operate and, um, you know, what their focus was, um, I joined their team as the director of portfolio strategies. Finally, um, you know, again, sort of hanging out in the online world, because I guess that's all, especially now, that's all people are really doing. Um, you know, I, I linked up with Tim Nash at Good Investing, um, and that is an area where, um, you know, the focus really is on, again, education, empowerment, and providing investors with a reasonable choice when it comes to aligning their investments with their values or with their ethics. Um, usually with, you know, the, I think the phraseology is, is you know, that some people will, will use is ESG investing, and that is part of it. But, you know, the big focus at good investing is values alignment when it comes to individuals and their investment portfolio. Perfect. I have one other side related uh, gig that I also do as well, too. Um, I'm the founder of an emissions free distribution business in Toronto called the Drop Distribution. We use electric vehicles to provide logistic services for local businesses. Um, so oh, wow. that's that's a part of who I am. It's part of what makes up sort of my day to day and, and week to week um, you know, focus. And um, behind that, I've been a CFA charter holder for, I think, about 10 years now. Uh, I just want to get you a chance to give a plug for the emissions free delivery business. Give me a little bit more there. I can't really go into too much detail in terms of like how I actually ended up in this space or doing this, but I, you know, I think it was really rooted in just wondering what I was going to do, you know, in terms of financial 
career um, when I left my corporate gig. I, I, I wasn't too pleased with, you know, some of the opportunities that I was looking at. And, you know, at the time with the evolution of the internet and looking at local logistics, you know, this sounded like an area that, you know, I, I thought I was able to use some of my experience in the energy infrastructure space, um, which that's where I was an analyst. I was an analyst um, for um, Sun Life Investment Management and, and covered their energy infrastructure um, investments. And so I took a lot of that thinking and applied it to local businesses, local logistics. Um, and then with the, you know, sort of push forward to have a, you know, minimal um, environmental footprint when it came to emissions. Um, so it started there and it has continued to go, which is fairly incredible. <laughs> What's the company name again, sorry? It's called The Drop Distribution. Yeah. Okay. Nice. I had no idea. So that's a, that's a cool one. That's, yeah. I guess that's sort of living your values, right? Totally. Totally. And it's been a nice thing to, to kind of have along for the ride as uh, I'm doing alongside the investment stuff. Yeah. Perfect. Now you were, and I think I got this from listening to your interview with Tim Nash, actually. So I, I just find this a curious bit of background, but you were working in the uh, sort of credit rating side in 2007 when the credit crisis kind of blew up. That's right. And that I, was quite an experience. Yeah, I'm sure you must have a couple of stories from the trenches you can share with us here, Daryl. Anything <laughs> good you can tell us about that? Um, you know, I think I think from the insider's point of view, and I say that term loosely, there's nothing really, you know, sort of complex or super black box ish about what credit rating agencies do. You know, it's it's mainly taken into consideration, you know, the credit worthiness of, of issuers, whether they're corporate or or structured issuers. And, you know, I, I think at the time, you know, this is when a lot of quantitative models and quantitative thinking in the financial services universe was, was and continued to have been at the very forefront of, of everything. Um, you very quickly saw how models can, you know, very easily fall apart, how all of the relationships and correlations that, you know, very, very smart people take forever to, to put together, they can definitely fall apart in times of crisis. Um, it was interesting for me getting an experience um, at uh, how credit rating agencies manage their real and perceived conflicts of interest. Like that's a legit thing. The people who are, uh, you know, who you're provided the credit rating for are usually the people paying you. So how are those conflicts managed? And, and getting an, an, an inside point of view on that. Again, there's, there's nothing particularly, um, you know, sort of malicious about about that, but you know what uh, tangibly, and you know, do, do organizations and, and people do to try and, and mitigate both the real and perceived risk around there. Um, but really, I think you know some of the fun things that happened were watch being ground zero for um, the collapse of ABCP, asset back commercial paper. Um, you know, those are letters I'm sure um, you know people in the investment industry haven't heard for some time. It might be a little bit triggering for some, but the world was very normal for a few months at a credit rating agency in 2007, and then it was. Um, kind of pandemonium after that. Um, yeah, I, I would say it, it, the, the cool stories from the rating agency were really more around the intellectual side, like the theory behind how some entities who might previously be rated investment grade, um, how they might not be, and you know how we responded to you know, changing financial metrics and the changing world in front of us. It's um, they're, they're really amazing discussions. Like those were the things that I that I took away um, from my from my years there. Um, and there really wasn't anything, you know, kind of incredible um, again or malicious about that experience. It, it was just such a traumatic time um, when it came to not just credit ratings, but the entire investment world, um, and then just having a firsthand view of, of everything. Equity prices being down 20% in one day, um, issuer after issuer after major bank or institution on the verge of collapse or actually collapsing, seeing those prices unfold in real time gives me shivers just thinking about them. And I'm sure anybody else who lived through that will, you know, sort of think back to the stuff they saw on their screens and, you know, just kind of look back in amazement. So it's, it's, it's crazy to think that that's, you know, 15 years ago or so now. And uh, that's a long time yeah. ago. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm curious a little more here then. So you were already a CFA charter holder at the time? At that time, yes. And so my first um, role in the, at, at DBRS, which is the credit rating agency, one of the, the, the kind of two main ones in Canada, um, my role there was uh, on the energy and infrastructure side. So credit ratings for uh, everything from small, medium size, um, you know, pipeline and midstream companies that you would see in, you know, BC or Alberta 
two large multinational oil companies. Um, my role was to dig through their quarterly annual statements and update whatever signed credit ratings that DBRS had assigned to them to issue investment grade debt in the Canadian markets. Um, that was my first role there. So, you know, your standard junior analyst job, ripping through statements, updating spreadsheets, and then eventually updating reports. And then finally, um, you know, communicating with the issuers, communicating with investors about your opinion, your rating, why it is, you know, better or worse than other um, issuers in the space. So really, really deep dive into corporate credit fundamentals. Um, and then neatly, very neatly, my follow on job was with um, Sun Life, in which case I was actually reading the, a lot of the same reports that I used to write. Um, so being on the, the, the buy side, what we call, um, so you're, you're actually um, you know, with the pot of money and, and actually on the investment management team, reading those same credit reports from you know, again, either DBRS or S&P or Moody's, whoever it was, um, you know, really nice follow on um, you know, role for me in that space. And Sun Life Investment Management is sort of the uh, institutional investing arm for Sun, right? That's uh, that's right. Yes, yeah. they'd be investing in the, the, what we call the what we used to call the the, the on balance sheet stuff, which is a lot of the the, the Life Co uh, business. Which is, I, I don't think a lot of people realize just how massive um, that to the uh, that book of business is. Yeah, when you just look at the like group benefits money flowing through a company like that, it's a it's a yep. huge amount of dollars. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, and I, I have to push a little bit more here, if you don't mind, but totally. the, so you mentioned the uh, conflict of interest issue, right? And I think mm -hmm. this is of particular interest for those who are on the investment side, because we just had, of course, the client focus reforms come up, right? As sort of like they're now fully there for everybody to deal with. And that makes a lot of comment about managing sort of, you know, that, that cost-based or price-based or payment-based conflict of interest. Do you think there's, any lessons learned from sort of the analyst side that that we should be thinking about on the now the, the like that client facing financial advisory side? Yeah, I think one of the missing components um, when it comes to more client focused re reforms and and dealing dealing with you know your your retail investing audience is that they don't necessarily have the tools or literacy to be able to analyze these real or perceived conflicts by comparison to institutional investors. You hang out in the credit rating universe and everybody knows the issuers are paying you for your credit rating, that's, that's not a secret. But there are teams of analysts who they themselves do additional diligence on the rating. They challenge the rating. They, they would call me up and be like, this is too high. Why have you got this rating at double A? I've got it at single. And so they have the tools and the literacy to be able to take that conflict and kind of risk assess it, you know, whatever we might be saying. The average investor out there does not have the tools to understand what is going on. The financial services world makes investing incredibly complicated, I think, for the average person out there. What they're talking about, the acronyms, the expectations on performance, everything is guided with the sales lens and it really minimizes education and empowerment. It drives me crazy. I'm, I'm really empowered, or excuse me, really passionate about providing that level of empowerment and literacy to people um, because I just see this massive gap there. An interesting one. And this echoes actually a conversation that I had uh, with John DeGuy and an episode that came out right around Christmas where he referenced, and I think rightly, the research of George Lowenstein, who sort of blows up this idea that disclosure is kind of enough that if you disclose a conflict of interest, the, the conflict of interest goes away. So right. it's, uh, yeah, thanks. I know that was off script, but I appreciate you uh, taking us down that path. It's no problem. So now, um, can you talk about what your ideal client is. And I don't know if you have different ideal clients kind of at you and yours versus uh, Spring um, versus at, at Good, but uh, do you have like one ideal client or do you have three ideal clients? Or how does <laughs> yeah. The ideal, the, the idea of the ideal client has been a really um, comfortable um, thing to get into over the last few years. Uh, it's been a way we've managed to, you know, more efficiently run our business. There are simply clients who work well and each one has a, you know, each channel has their own ideal client um, to answer, firstly answer that question. Um, you know, with Spring, the ideal client tends to be more families with multi-generational wealth, family enterprises, they're incorporated, they tend to have substantial investable asset bases, three, five million and up. 
um, they could have you know cross-border considerations to look into. Um, so these are clients with um, high net worths and more complex financial planning needs. That is the spring ideal client. The you and yours ideal client, so my firm when I first started, is really somebody who wants to understand a little bit more about investing in general, not just do-it-yourself investing, but just investing in general and be able to make a more informed decision about what they do with their money. Um, they can be people who are new to investing. They can be people who are seasoned and, you know, seasoned investors themselves be working with an investment advisor and, you know, they may not feel that they're getting um, everything that they want to out of that relationship. So they reach out to me and, you know, engagements tend to be, you know, very conversational and um, very focused on literacy. Um, I do explicit portfolio reviews for clients at you and yours. Um, there's no minimum asset size. Uh, there, it's just based on, you know, the the hours that that are required to do the review, the complexity of the client portfolio or portfolios, um, and you know, really, it is about that again, education empowerment. Um, and you know, I think that's a really sort of you know fun um, you know sort of avenue for for clients, especially when they feel like you know they're not getting what they want out of their current relationship or want to establish a relationship, you know, my role is quite unique in, in terms of being independent. I don't sell products. I don't, you know, sort of have any connection to a specific investment solution out there. So I can guide clients towards ideas or solutions that are going to be um, a better fit for them. That's helpful. And the, uh, so the you and yours client, would they be like, do you consider them like second opinion clients or they, or is it, you know, when you say a casual conversation, I'm assuming there's a very heavy education orientation to that conversation. Yeah, the casual, that I think when I was referring to casual conversation, it's really the conversation around their, um, their portfolio, what they're desiring uh, or what they desire from the portfolio, uh, you, know, or, you know, what's in there. It's not going to be rooted in quantitative metrics. We're not ripping through, you know, every single holding and looking at PE ratios or, you know, EV to EBITDA. Uh, we're not looking at, you know, from a specific, you know, sort of quantitative focus um, or, or, or style of investing or, or grading. It's really about finding that right fit. We do look at, you know, break it down, their portfolios, what sectors, what geographies, you know, how much are they paying in fees? The portfolio review as a, um, as a service, you know, is a, is, I would say the most popular, I'd say at, at you and yours, um, you know, that people, you know, have investment relationships with their advisor. Um, sometimes it's, many relationships with different advisors over time and then they you know want a more comprehensive look at their individual portfolio or their portfolio as an aggregate um, and to you know provide you know it's not advice that i can provide that them but i can provide them you know with feedback about what they've actually got in their portfolio um, and then finally for good investing the ideal client there is somebody who is again really focused on that values alignment piece. And, you know, the clients come to good investing on a spectrum. Some hear about ESG investing and might want to kind of dip their toe in the water and they're curious. They recognize that, you know, this ESG and, and social responsible investing are becoming more and more um, in the mainstream. And so they want to, you know, kind of take a peek at it, kind of, you know, kick the tires a little bit. Um, and then kind of on the other end of the spectrum, we have people who are um, absolutely certain that they do not want to hold certain sectors or companies in their portfolio. They are more of the, the values aligned um, clients who say, you know, I, I absolutely, I'm, I'm concerned about, um, you know, climate change and I, I don't want to hold companies that contribute to climate change in my portfolio. Um, you know, I want them eliminated. So they tend to be more inclusion exclusion clients. Um, they are, and I would use the description more values based um, when they're looking at those sectors. Um, sometimes they are outright include uh, inclusion or exclusion clients, and sometimes they want to at least you know mitigate some of those you know specific industries or sectors. But there's a wide range in. Um, you know, the client type there from people who have, you know, very um, sort of soft needs to include ESG factoring to clients who are more focused on outright inclusion or exclusion of certain sectors. It's interesting. So you mentioned quite a few things here I'd like to dig into. One of the things is you said you, you don't really give specific investment advice, right? You don't carry a securities right. license today. That's yeah. right. So where do you draw that line? How do you kind of know what's permitted by regulation and what would be um, offside or how far can you sort of go with, with helping somebody to, to make better investment decisions? 
Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. It's not, I would say, explicitly spelled out by the regulator what you can and can't say. They yeah. say you cannot provide information that is purported to be or, or provide investment advice that is purported to be tailored to the individual. So I've spent many months, years talking about debating, consulting with people about what that actually means. And really where it ends is at the discussion of, of asset allocation, um, providing a specific asset allocation to a client could run afoul of what the invest uh, of what the OSC deems as specific and tailored investment advice. We can definitely provide, and I can definitely provide guidance about what are reasonable asset allocations for certain investors and investor types, depending on your financial objectives. But saying outright, you know what it you know what it ought to be um, is 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 a little bit tricky. So that's you know kind of where that line is. So would you have a client bring you a portfolio, and you might say, well. You know, you've told me your values are X, but your portfolio is going to do Y. So your portfolio is offside or is it you kind of have to like handhold the client or educate the client to get them from recognizing that portfolio doesn't match values? How, how sort of how far can you go with that? The, the education component is is huge in it. Um, it's very, I think, recently part of that discussion is really talking to investors about either their over or under performance. And so a lot of people you know, will come and say, well, my, my performance is, was they think it's not good or sometimes they think it's outstanding. Um, but there are under, underlying reasons why they might have under or overperformed what they think is a reasonable benchmark. And that's what I, I jump into. It's really the, the transparency and educational component. It's not to say, you know, well, you're this person and you need to have, you know, this specific mix of investment assets and, and these specific asset classes. It's really to say, you know, hey, you've got a long-term time horizon. You know, you could have the ability to take on more risk in your portfolio if you are willing to do that, right? It's providing that educational piece about how do you decide what an appropriate asset allocation is? What are the different factors, time horizon, liquidity, um, unique circumstances? You know, when you put those all together, including you know, the preference for certain values alignment, you know, what are the options out there for investors? I think that uh, covers it. So then can you talk about what caused you to decide to go to the the advice only space, like you have your CFA charter, you could easily have gone to a place that works on an AUM model. What makes you land here? I wanted to be a little bit more client facing. Um, I had a, um, an amazing experience, you know, which we, we just kind of went over a, a little bit of, you know, being an analyst, um, you know, on the bond side, which is, you know, fairly unique in the Canadian market. Um, but then having the experience through the credit crisis, during the credit crisis was all an amazing um, experience, which I, I knew I was getting at the time. And then, you know, I think after a while, I was hoping to have uh, a career which was a bit more, again, client facing, and then trying to figure out where I felt comfortable landing, you know, from everything from, you know, sort of like the bank brokerages to the independent investment advisors on there, either doing, you know, portfolio management stuff being more you know, sort of on the investor side of things, you know, am I a PM or an analyst somewhere else, or am I more client facing? I, I wanted to be client facing. I couldn't find the right environment for which I felt I would have the flexibility to um, coach, empower, educate people, and not feel pressured to sell them, you know, product that that I had simply because I was working for that that specific firm. So it's really, a, you know, I was I was kind of displeased with the options out there. Um, what I found to be the need through just hanging out with friends, you're you're out for drinks late at night, you're hanging out at a restaurant, you really get into it with somebody with, you know, they're just learning and their eyes are wide open when they're they're hearing about, this, you know, these concepts, which are, you know, I, I know and hear about all the time, but the regular person out there is not really sure, like, what is an ETF? They're like, I, 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 my advisor told me to buy this mutual fund, like, I don't know, should I? You know, uh, I, I've got this list of investment products or, or investment selections for my, um, you know, for my, my group RSP, which one, how do I, pick, how do I assess them? Like, what am I looking at? All these different questions. It made me feel, and I definitely feel like there continues to be this massive need for investor education out there that really was not being met. So um, it was really playing into what I wanted to do, my strengths, I think, and being able to break down more complex um, and, and even not so complex um, investment phenomenon and just talk about them casually with people. Like to me, I like doing that. I, I love seeing people get the, have the aha moments. Um, and I really wanted to, to, you know, sort of land in an environment or create an environment where I had the freedom to do that. You'll find some people push back and say, well, 
I mean, I can learn anything I want on the internet today. So why do I need to pay you for, you know, really making me a better investor? I mean, I don't hear from them because they don't contact they, me yeah, at all. They in the first place, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so. I, I mean, I, I get it. I mean, and the saying that I use, uh, you know, I've been using a lot more nowadays is that there's plenty of information out there. There is not a whole lot of insight. Um, if you want insight, especially as it pertains to your own situation, good luck finding it on Reddit or on Twitter or on Instagram or on TikTok. Like, go for it. it if you value your own time, and if you value confidence in your information source, then paying for that advice or paying for that education explicitly could be a better use of your time, depending on who you are. That's a good distinction. I used to be in the army and we used to talk about information versus intelligence, right? Yeah. So, yeah. So that's good. Yeah. Um, now, is there anything we mentioned client focused performs already once? Is there anything in client focused performs that will change anything that you do in that advice only space? I don't think there's anything directly that, that really changes when, uh, other than being more sensitive to titles. Not that I ever use the title of say an investment advisor or so, but they're going to be, you know, sort of titles that are, are not going to be available and, and for good reason to, to, you know, help focus the public on, you know, who people are and, and what they actually do. I think I've been a vice are, president three times though. <laughs> yeah. Tell me about it. Like, yeah. you know, how it's, I mean, we're in this space and we see all the different titles, all the different service offerings, all the different compensation models. And it takes energy from, for us as professionals to, and people who are familiar with the space to figure out, well, what, what is, oh that, oh, that person's doing that thing. Okay. You know, and I can only imagine how confusing that would be to the retail investor out there. Um, when it comes to client focus reforms, I think one of the biggest benefits is simply awareness and, and opening the eyes of the general public to the fact that there are these different titles and regulations and, you know, hopefully streamlining it a little bit. And there's more supporting literacy and voices out there that are saying, Hey, you might think you're talking to this person who is doing X, but maybe you should ask them these sets of questions just so you can, you know, have some certainty around that. I find that that's, you know, indirectly one of the big benefits to, to a lot of the reforms that are coming out nowadays is that clients become, uh, have become a lot more prepared. They become a lot more aware and interested in looking at the different options out there because there's so many, you know, voices out there, 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 there's much more diversity in terms of the, the, the different models and, and firms are, you know, frankly, having to disclose, you know, what they're doing, how much they're charging, why are they charging that amount? So it's, it's all been a positive, um, you know, for the space, uh, that, that uh, the advice only space. Yeah, I think time will be the test, but I think two, three, maybe four years from now, we are going to have better models for assessing how much risk and I know the language here isn't perfect yet, but how much risk somebody can be taking on so yeah. that, that optimal um, sort of risk mix. Um, now, what about uh, technology tools here, Daryl? What do you have in your, because you, you have kind of a unique role. So, and you're, you know, I assume you've kind of built your technology stack. So what are you doing on the tech side? Nothing fancy. Um, I've got Morningstar for a lot, or I'd say the bulk of the um, um, sort of regular portfolios that are out there for clients. Um, that is helpful um, in you know putting together pieces of information um, that I can put together then and and combine with. Um, you know, my assessment, my overall assessment of client portfolios. So there's Morningstar and there's Snap Projections, which has been a, a really excellent one in, in recent years that has come out and made some of the, you know, investment planning aspects uh, for clients uh, a lot easier than ripping through Excel sheets or multiple Excel sheets and changing factors here and having to change, um, you know, factors and results elsewhere um, in your models. So those are the two main ones that I use. So I just had... Uh... Oh no, I'm going to forget her name and it's awful. Uh, Ms. Martin and Martinson anyways, from uh, snap, uh, we just did a video together actually. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, it, it's, it's fantastic. I really, really liked how, and, and snap isn't the only one in the space. There are, there are more and more, um, you know, firms that have come out and, you know, you know identified this need to add in a, a more elegant solution when it came to actual, you know, planning and looking at questions about, you know, withdrawal and, and taxes and, you know, trying to optimize that. I think, you know, where we've landed is, is, is really awesome and, and it just continues to improve. 
Yeah, that's it. So sorry, Brett, for forgetting your wife's name. I know one of the <laughs> listeners is going to be listening to that and saying, Jason, you should remember. Lee, that's her name. <laughs> Lee Martinson. All right, there we go. Um, I just... So you mentioned earlier, um, you know, this idea of values-based investing and, and you know, sort of exclusionary portfolios or you know, excluding certain types of investments. And I know the kind of most common vernacular you'll see today is ESG. And I know right. that doesn't necessarily, like that's not quite the right term, I think in general. Um, first off, what's your favorite term here? What should we be talking about? Um, oh, I've got the worst and most typical financial planner type answer for you. It depends. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Yep, there you go. So if you're talking about the space in general, I think the majority of the industry wants to say ESG or ESG factors as this broad umbrella that incorporates other than quantitative and your standard quantitative and qualitative um, you know, assessments for, for companies and determining um, securities pricing. It's a very sort of nerdy way of, of trying to distinguish um, what at least I think ESG investing is versus kind of regular investing, but it is, is layering in these other considerations around environmental, social and, and governance considerations into security selection. That's ESG, but within or beside ESG, you can have clients that may have different preferences and for which a different term might be more suitable. I've gone out of my way to, to call it explicitly values-based investing because for those clients, there isn't even an ESG component. They don't want to know what the ESG scoring is for a company like TransCanada Pipelines, or they don't want to know the ESG scoring for say, you know, uh, Exxon Mobil. They're just like, I don't want those companies in my portfolio. They don't align with my values. I want them out and I should have the, um, the flexibility and voice to be able to exclude them from a portfolio. That is what I describe as, as more values based investing. But I think, you know, there's socially responsible investing and, you know, that's going to be a broad term that's going to, you know, depend on each individual. So I think the problem that the industry has in general right now is that people want to try and lump this alternative way of security selection into with with one name and with one style and one characteristics and there are many many styles and and, and versions and alternatives that clients can have and it really depends so and it, it, to me i see that as being the biggest hurdle about even having an informed discussion about esg is that people don't even agree on what it is so i see these arguments happening all the time and i'm like you're not you're talking about two different things Right, like, or many different things, and it really depends on the client, you know, and 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 what they're actually looking for. It's a fair way. So, really, when you say it depends, it's like, client, what are your values? And now we're going to go and look at what has to go into building a port, or what could go into building a portfolio for you, I suppose. Yeah, some clients, it's not about the values piece. It's they see the value or they perceive the value and have an ESG criteria included in the investment selection process. So that style of investing is going to be different and have a different set of characteristics. I think that's the, that's the, the style of investing that, you know, people tend to argue about a little bit more is the, um, what is the alpha that you generate from ESG investing and alpha being, you know, what is the, you know, there's an additional cost to it. So what is the incremental benefit on a year to year or over a long-term basis? That's the part where, where people get really sort of caught up and they, they fight back and forth and somebody uses data from this point in time and someone else uses data from a different jurisdiction and, and it's so messy <laughs> and it is, it is uh, quite contentious. Um, so there is that, but there are certain clients that we have and who, you know, I would say are the kind of classic good investing clients who simply want values alignment um, investments with their, their personal values. And so there's, there's less ambiguity around that. Yeah, that's a, that's a tricky one. It's tricky. The entire industry, I think, has stayed away from um, ESG, socially responsible, values-based investing, um, and they've kind of been forced into it just by the way, sort of, you know, what clients are asking for and, and what's going on nowadays. Um, I can definitely remember, you know, being on, you know, an energy analyst and we're, you know, we've, we've got multiple billions of dollars of investments in Alberta, in pipeline companies, in oil sands companies. Well, you know, if the world is changing and there's much more of a focus on climate mitigation, you know, what does that mean for the regulatory environment? What does that mean for the profitability of these certain firms? Um, you know, might there be the, the risk of stranded assets or certain companies 
falling from investment grade to non-investment grade. So these were these were and have been serious considerations for at least the institutional part of the investment world that I worked in for quite some time. Uh, that said, on the retail side of things, you, you, there's been a lot more, I think, sort of confusion and I think, um, you know, sort of debate around it. Um, but I'd say at least on the institutional side, these are real concerns and have been for some time. Um, if you're a large life insurance company and, you know, you've got a changing world around you, how do you think about your investments in 30 or 40 or 50 year increments? Right. It was never really about quarterly or, or year to year returns. It's like, you know, are you going to get your money back in 30 or 40 years? So the, the mentality, the thinking, um, the incorporation of these additional factors was huge. Now, what about for the retail investor? This is always, you know, my question is a lot of what I see, and I, you know, I'm a regular listener to David O'Leary's podcast. He does the mm -hmm. uh, investing podcast. And, you know, he does a great job of having lots of guests on there who have really wonderful kind of impact based ideas. Um, very few of them are suitable for the retail investor, like uh, unless right, you're right. accredited or whatever the case is. But so, in terms of like, is this really just a matter of choosing from the universe of publicly traded securities and saying, you know, here's how you build a portfolio that that doesn't have, you know, certain oil and gas stocks in it or doesn't have weapons manufacturers in it or or do people, do you get people who actually find, you know, who, who might use community bonds or, you know, who, who might cross that threshold into uh, accredited investor? Where does that go? It's a mix. Um, there are certainly clients for which they're, you know, based on their specific profile, um, specific impact investments or like community bonds may not be as appropriate for them. Um, so yes, some clients might be choosing from the available set of ESG themed uh, ETFs or funds out there for which there are plenty that are greenwashed, um, you know, actually, um, you know, they're, they're greenwashed investment options out there, um, or there are clients who are investing in that, but they also have part of their investment portfolio in you know something like um coal power solar share you know those are you know very popular ones that you know available in canada um you know more targeted um definitely more i think it's objective to say that there is there's a, a greater you know sort of risk return uh, in them um that said you're getting paid a bit more for those those bonds so there can be solutions that run from you know a widely available etf to more targeted impact investments um, that clients, especially are the good investing clients, they're, they're super excited about those ones. Um, they, they understand what the impact investment is, the outcomes most times and, and many times, especially for Toronto based folks, they can pass by and they can actually see, you know, what they are um, supporting. There is a financial benefit to them and there is also a emotional benefit to them. So I think that is a really outstanding combination for, for people. That makes sense. What about micro stuff like, you know, Kiva? I've, I've supported Kiva myself in the past. Is this like, do you see this as an investment at all? Or is it like a hobby? What's, what's the deal with something like Kiva? Um, I don't know Kiva, to be honest with you. Oh, is, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So this is like microfinance. So this is where you can do like 25 or $50 to somebody who is going to, ah. I don't know, go and buy like uh, the equipment to do dairy farming for their you know, three cows or that okay. kind of thing in, in sort of, so it, I find it interesting. I did some of that work in my former life and uh, you know, it's, it's interesting to see those, those little, like those microfinance applications, but I've never thought of it as an investment myself. So. Yeah, I think there, there's, there's this sort of gray, graying area between, you know, sort of explicitly what you call an investment and expect a financial return from, from something that, it might borderline on on philanthropy, um, but you know I think for investors who are looking at micro investments as an option or alternative investments, which can include you know some of these you know areas that we're talking about, you know placing them within the context of a diversified portfolio is is important. Um, not overdoing it, understanding um, and and having the literacy to be able to reasonably select and allocate your money towards whatever it might be, something that you're expecting a return from or something that you're like, I'll probably get my money back. And if I do, that'll be great. Um, you know, they, they've got that flexibility, but the key thing, you know, and, and we run into this all the time is even if we aren't, you know, have not heard about a specific investment opportunity out there um, of which there are you know, hundreds of thousands out there. And sometimes clients bring them to us. We provide them with assistance 
and looking at those opportunities and then thinking about, you know, how reasonably might they be incorporated into a portfolio. And again, not providing specific advice, but just saying, hey, this is a more risky investment opportunity. Should it be 80% of your portfolio? Mm, probably not. But, you know, can this be part, a small part of your portfolio? Sure. Um, and you use the term greenwashing here. So do you sort of, is where you put on your analyst hat and you were able to like look at mutual fund A, mutual fund B and say like greenwashed, not greenwashed. Is that how you do that? We spend a lot of time digging through ETF methodologies, fund methodologies, looking at, you know, what's stated versus, you know, what's actually included in the portfolio. So um, we, we tend to go through them and then, yeah, kind of mark them off as, you know, and, and really it's not greenwash versus not greenwash. It's really unappealing selection for our client base versus, you know, one, uh, something that might be more appealing. Um, plan, again, plenty of, I think I would say less so now we have fewer ETFs out there that are marketing themselves as, as being say, um, fossil fuel free. Um, that aren't actually fossil fuel free. They're actually doing it nowadays. That that didn't happen um, a, a number of years ago, um, as an example. But you know, for clients that come to, especially good investing, who are passionate about not having companies that manufacture weapons or tobacco companies or bottling companies it could be ones that have a significant environmental impact. You know, all, a lot of the work that we do at good investing is digging through the investable options out there and really trying to narrow down the field that could be better selections for the, our, our ideal clients. And, and really that's the core of, of what we do is, is providing that research um, and education for clients. So we can say, hey, if, if you're focused on including these certain sectors, green energy, or companies that are you know, focused on environmental remediation or water infrastructure, here are some investment options that can work for you. If you're focused on eliminating these certain sectors, well, this set of inv investment options can work for you. Again, you can't specifically say which one or which few to actually include in your portfolio, but we can do a lot of that legwork for the client and provide them you know, with the education to be able to start putting together a diversified portfolio. And I would assume that roughly 100% of clients at uh, Good would be concerned about that to some extent, at least. For sure, yes. And your you and yours clients, do you find that they tend to have the same sort of philosophy? Is that, or do you get a mix there? Get a mix there. Part of the client intake form and part of any kind of engagement. Um, and frankly, it's part of the IPS for for clients. Do you have any specific investing preferences? And you know, some clients will say preference for. Um, green energy preference to exclude um, energy sector companies. Um, and, you know, what's nice about the, the entire, you know, when we're talking about information versus insight, um, I would say definitively what is positive nowadays is, is people are more informed. They, they, they understand the terminologies, they see them in different places, set in different ways. So they come to us saying, you know, uh, this is, you know, kind of what I'm looking for. Um, I understand that I may not be able to get every single company that I don't want from every single sector out of my portfolio, I understand diversification. I understand the fact that there are different companies included in these portfolios. Help me try and find, you know, good, better, best options out there. Um, so we really are, you know, do benefit from clients, you know, being able to just from a starting point, like think about, you know, what's even in their portfolio, right? As opposed to it just being some kind of line with the rate of return. You know, clients are understanding that these are individual security selections inside ETFs or funds, and they want to know more about them. They want to ensure that, you know, there is at least some consideration for um, ESG factors in there, or they even want to go further and just outright overweight or underweight include or exclude certain companies or sectors. Makes sense. Um, and at spring, I mean, just because at spring, you said you do get a lot of, um, let's say, higher net worth clients. Right. So, and same deal, I assume you use an IPS there as well, the investment policy statements, right? So does that trigger the thought for people? Like, do they say, oh, I never even really thought about it. But, you know, as you, like when you ask, does it, does it cause a reaction or do people, like if they are so inclined, then great. And if they're not, then it just goes away. It can. Um, it's it's been interesting because I, you know, sort of wondered to what extent that would show up with um, clients with a 
sizably different asset base and it does show up with with them um you know they have and i, I use the phraseology they but clients with um you know portfolios that are in the multiple millions of dollars i i would say as far as investor preferences go there's not a meaningful difference between the clients that i had placed in the mass affluent category they're hearing about um you know the the, the world changing they're hearing about climate change they're understanding that you know there are considerations around security selection um, that may have not traditionally been included in portfolios that but can be included in portfolios sometimes they it carries the belief that ESG incorporation will lead to outsized investment returns and I'm always careful to instruct them that that is not necessarily true um, and you know you have to just sort of look at you know what the factors are and what your own financial objectives are, your time horizon. And yes, I think over time, and I personally do believe this, that the incorporation of factors surrounding ESG will provide outsized returns over a long period of time. And I think where I differ personally from a lot of other people out there is that I'm looking at returns for clients. And especially if you're thinking about spring clients or multi-generational clients or your family wealth or family enterprises, I'm looking at it more for a multiple decade time frame because that's what I come out of, you know, when you're investing in long-term bonds, which have 30, 40, 50 year maturities, I'm used to thinking about the world in, in, in decades. And I think a lot of people in the investment space are used to thinking about it in quarters. Um, so I think, you know, ESG is something to, to definitely consider. Um, it's not for everyone, I would say that. Um, not everyone is going to have that comfort. Um, they will believe in, you know, sort of traditional non-ESG analysis out there. Um, but I personally think it is, is something that will lead to um, improved performance, if not from the return standpoint, then from the, the, the risk and the volatility standpoint, you'd have a, a decreased uh, um, risk on, on that side of things. And you're not boring me. Sorry, Daryl. I've been uh, no sleepless nights here lately. So yeah, thanks. All right. Um, now, you've brought up the IPS a couple of times. Um, do you use a pro forma IPS? Is it one you built? Where do you get your IPS from? It's a mix from copying, you know, uh, IPS is a different institution, quite honestly, and then rooted in whatever CFA Institute had on our level three exam. Um, it's some, it's, it's a mix of those. Um, what I've done is taken a look at, you know, institutional IPSs out there, um, and I've customized my own because the majority of the clients that I'm working with are, are retail investors and, and they're not going to have, you know, the, the same kind of, you know, vernacular and, or, and requirements as an institutional IPS. So start with the institutional IPS, get rid of the things that don't matter, include a few additional, you know, kind of helpful tidbits for clients. And that serves them as a framework for which they can go do whatever they want. If you want to go to a robo advisor and have your funds managed by a robo, great, go for it. If you want to find a an independent um, you know, asset manager in, in Canada, if you want your funds actually managed. Um, there are some fantastic investment managers in Canada and you know, they're not free, but they're not you know, charging you 2% for closet index funds. Um, so you, know, you can take your IPS and you can go that direction if you so please. If you'd like to match um, your IPS with your own do-it-yourself solution, there are investment products out there right now that make the matching of your asset allocation to you know, your actual investments or your targeted asset allocation to your investments, really, really easy. Um, and I'm talking about, um, you know, and not to, you know, sort of pump this investment product, but asset allocation ETFs, just as an idea and a concept, I think is one of the most um, impactful investment um, solutions that's come out in like probably 30 years or 40 years since the, since the online brokerage account. Um, that used to be the biggest holdup for DIY investors has traditionally been what investments do I pick and what amounts? Um, and then following that, the act of rebalancing. And now with asset allocation ETFs, they've, they've taken that away from you. Now, that's no comment on the actual selections in them, the actual securities inside them. I'm just talking about asset allocation ETFs as a, as a product that charges 25 basis points to basically do what robo advisors do for about like 70 or so. Yeah, these are like VBAL or VGrow or whatever the case is, the single ticket ETF. That's right. The VGrow, yeah. VBALs, XGrow, XBALs. You, I'm sure every single company, honestly, every single company out there, they're just going to add their uh, letter to the front and they will have an asset allocation ETF. And it's a really great product for, again, not everyone, but uh, at least a certain um, type of investor out there who um, you know, wants to have their, their money managed passively um, and at a very low fee. 
Yeah, makes a lot of sense. And I get the appeal of them for sure. And, you know, when you look at how much, uh, and, you know, I can look at like Terrence O'Dean's research where he says complexity is the biggest enemy of the average investor. And now you have a tool you can just get rid of almost all the complexity of uh, at least choosing investments or knowing what to be invested in and when, you know, that, that's really nice. So, you really yeah. can. Um, and it's, it's nice to be in the position where, you know, knowing that, you know, that's just one of a few tools available for people. It may not be the best one for everyone. And, uh, you know, and an actual, you know, traditional investment manager out there might be, and then very often is the case, especially for more higher net worth clients who have, um, you know, trusts or holding companies, corporations, um, you know, those one ticket asset allocation ETFs may not be the best solution for them. Um, in which case, you know, a, a more managed approach is, is better. Yeah, I agree. It's certainly, there's nothing that's perfect for everybody that would be, I mean, that goes back to your, it depends <laughs> answer before. Yeah. So, um, now, when you do the IPS, because it's a, a good IPS has a lot of sort of thought provoking questions in it. Yep. Do you find that people have good responses to those or do you find people are kind of bothered by it? They're like, well, they're like, you know, I told you what I want to do. Leave me alone. Or do you find you get into really good conversations out of the IPS? I've had great experiences with the IPS um, with clients. Um, it's something that I, I noticed wasn't prevalent in the retail invest and investor um, environment. And so whether it's a seasoned investor who's just seen the IP, an IPS for the first time and they're like 68, or if it's someone who's new, they both have really positive responses. It provides them both the, the framework, but also flexibility to go where they want in the manner that they want. So it's not prescriptive, like, you know, hey, this, that, then that, and this is how your portfolio absolutely needs to be. And this is the only solution it's framing. It's just articulating. What is your time horizon? Do you have liquidity requ requirements? Are these taxable funds or non-taxable funds? Like these are very basic questions that I think each and every investor ought to go through, whether they're investing on their own, they're investing it with a, a third party manager. And the response I get from people is very much that, oh, this is this is great. Like I've never had this before. I've never really gone through these this this process. And I know there are probably advisors out there kind of groaning because you know they have some process that is like a KYC or an onboarding thing or, or whatnot. But I, I really do think it is the the more explicit you know sort of style that I've that I've put things together that allows people to 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 at least. Um, you know, sort of narrow down the the options available for them, or at least in, at least understand what questions they should be asking of themselves. Like that's kind of one of the hardest things as any investor is is just trying to understand. You know, what questions do I ask myself? What things matter? And so, doing an IPS is basically like, hey, here, this is what matters: time horizon, your willingness, ability to to to, to undertake risk taxability of your account, legal, on and on and on. So, you know, that, that is a really helpful, um, you know, tool that investors have. Um, and the response has been awesome. That, that makes sense. And I can see, you know, when you have a good set of sort of um, investigative questions that people have not thought about, and you can get some meaning that they might not have considered previously. So, yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Now, you sort of touched on it. So you you don't have a compliance department. You don't have any securities licensing, mm -hmm. but there's going to be plenty of people licen or listening, sorry, who work in either MFDA shops or IROC shops, or even potentially just insurance licensed and maybe doing seg funds. Um, what kind of thoughts or what, what have you learned in your practice that might apply or might be useful for somebody who's working in that shop where they they do have a, a compliance oversight on their uh, investment activities. Oh, it's a, it's a great question. Um, I think with, um, you know, in the more regulated environments, um, firstly, I would say what, what, you know, anyone in those practices can do immediately and th that I like doing is just speaking in my own voice and having that guide my client interactions. Some firms and advisors are, are, may not have the, the flexibility to either kind of do that or present client materials in a, in a certain way and the, like their way. Um, but, you know, I think, you know, I use analogies a ton to help clients understand investments. I really do take the time to, um, you know, help 
clients understand all of their investment options out there uh, and being able to put it into context, you know, what the difference is between a robo and, you know, a, a managed fund and, and doing it yourself, being able to do that, I think clients really, really appreciate. And, you know, maybe even if you're not in the situation where you can't offer, you know, and multiple options or different options to clients, I find that just being able to frame the investment universe, stocks, bonds, ETFs, funds, indexes, exchanges, robos, all that stuff, being able to talk freely about all those different options out there really helps simplify the world for clients. Because ultimately, clients, I think, think investments are this unlimited field of different things all over the place. And when you help them realize that, you know, at the very root of things, you're just repackaging certain stocks and bonds in, in different ways with a different compensation model and, and different marketing channels when you help people understand it that way they kind of go oh okay this makes a lot more sense um you know so that could be one tool that that might be helpful is, is a bit more focus on you know the kind of in, in investor education piece um you know without knowing that that you know additional complexities that they'd have to deal with and and um, specifically in their, their own practices yeah i think that uh, i mean i just did a sort of uh financial literacy package for some folks in the nonprofit I work with here in Edmonton. And the very first thing we did was what's a stock, what's a bond. Right. Right. Because ultimately almost anything you can invest in is either a stock or a bond. <laughs> Pretty like, much. And yeah. And yeah, I, th I think it's, it's been fun just having, you know, it's, it's, it's fun on the one side, but you know, the, the growth and the prosperity of advice only firms is going to be significantly different from, you know, any other AUM type model. Um, for starters, we have our, our revenue model tends to be more one off. Um, we have clients who are repeat clients who do check ins who do annual reviews, but it is not the AUM model where you have a constant stream of cash flow. Um, the way we get our agents going is we spell it out, we put together proposals, um, clients are paying us directly um, for the educational piece. So we lay it out what they expect to learn and come away with the, uh, from the engagement with, you know, what we hope the basically the learning outcomes are, it is much more like a university course in terms of how I think about my practice, you know, than an actual investment management firm, there's kind of a curriculum that I roll out to clients, and they in effect kind of pay me to to be a teaching assistant, um, you know, how I conduct my business. Yeah, uh, is is yeah easily much more like a, a mini university course, um, you know, or a continuing ed course um, by comparison to you know sort of a, a traditional AUM investment manager. Yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. And I hear the uh, kids maybe the this is the era of COVID, so you get the kids look like they're clamoring to have you back here. So I'll maybe wrap us up. Is there any final thoughts you have for us, or any question I should have asked about this that I didn't ask? Um, I love the I love the questions, Jason. Like they they're they're great. I I love kind of digging deep into these different areas, and I think we covered a lot of ground. I think one of the, the fun things that I think about over time is is how these different models, like there's so many out there, device only, fee only, fee based. Um, I, what is top of mind for me, um, you know, thinking about my practice going forward and, and and the world around us is how these models change in the era of what I would largely describe um, as decumulation. So it's really kind of, again, sort of coming from my background of thinking of things in sort of like decades, I do wonder what happens when the significant mass of boomers comes through the traditional AUM firms and then you know the funds which have been growing and growing and growing, hopefully for some time, um, how does that model work in an era of decumulation? It'll be a fun one to figure out. And I suspect more firms will change their pricing models. I've already started to see it um, in, in, uh, in different areas, but they will have to change their pricing models to figure out um, you know, how to meet changing client needs, which are going to absolutely, and have already started to focus more around financial planning, retirement planning, cash flow planning. I think those are areas which were conveniently overlooked um, you know, over many, many decades, and those are have to come into focus. So firstly, clients, uh, uh, firms will have to figure out um, you know, how they're, they're income and expenses work when it comes to um, you know, providing those services. Um, and they'll also have to figure out how to deliver them because I think that's a skill set that may be in question. What's in a financial plan? What's in a cash flow plan? Are you providing them an actual plan or planning? You know, I think those are interesting ideas and services uh, that are going to evolve significantly over time. So it's fun. I, I really do enjoy like, you know, kind of watching this stuff and 
um, you know, how, how it will change. Starting out a little bit on the future of financial planning, right? That's good. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So, well, thanks so much, Daryl. You've been great. You've uh, really a broad range of uh, content you're, you're able to talk about here. And I appreciate that. Um, and a little bit of a different model from lots of the folks that I would deal with regularly. So thanks for sharing all that with us and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. You as well, too. I really appreciate the invite. We'll chat again soon. Thanks. All right, we covered a lot of ground there. I really enjoyed Daryl's anecdote at the beginning. Um, I don't know if he considers it an anecdote, I guess, but uh, his discussion about his time uh, working in a bond rating agent or bond rating uh, job. That's uh, pretty interesting considering what happened in the credit crisis. All right, the number for this episode is seven. The number for this episode is seven. And I hope you'll join me again in two weeks time. In two weeks, we'll have another investment-themed episode. We're going to look at using a, a digital asset manager uh, to complement, let's say, a traditional insurance practice. So join me again in two weeks. Thank you very much, and enjoy your continued studies. Thanks for watching. Use the link in the description down below to join our CE program. With many of our videos, subscribers can do a short quiz for CE credits, and you'll have access to our full library of content.